All right, Sebastian Younger, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so your latest book is called Tribe. Um, but I think for people to understand the argument you're trying to make in it, uh, I think they need to know a bit about the background of your previous work. Uh, in 2007, 2008, you were on assignment for Vanity Fair in the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan, uh, where you spent a year with a U.S. platoon, a remote outpost called Restrepo. And that's where your film, your documentary Restrepo came from, and your uh, book War came from that assignment. I'm curious, what did you learn about war that surprised you or would surprise most civilians from your work in the Korangal Valley? Probably the most surprising thing for me about war in that context was how the experience of fear is diminished when you're in a group. Um, how your central concern can shift from yourself to others. Uh, I studied anthropology in college and that started to make sense to me. There, there, in our, in our evolutionary past, there really was no individual survival outside of group survival. So one very good way of promoting your own survival, your own interests, is to actually devote yourself to the welfare of the group. It actually makes great evolutionary sense. And, and I got to experience that sort of in the flesh, as it were, in, in real time out of Restrepo with this platoon. Um, I, I, um, I should say that the end result of, of that very intense human bond that's created in combat is that often men miss combat. I, I say men because it was all men in the platoon I was with. Um, often men miss combat. What they're sometimes mistaken for is missing violence. And perhaps some of them do, I don't know. But I think the, the thing that is really compelling, uh, that they really do miss when they finally get home, is that very close bond. It's not uh, reproducible in civilian society because there's no need for it. And it's something that, that they can have a great longing for, actually. And my, um, you know, a lot of my book has been, a lot of my work has been sort of focused on that, that sort of strange irony of combat. Right. Um, yeah, and, and going to that point, you know, the, the platoon you're embedded in was all male, and they're taking part in a traditionally all male activity. I'm curious, I mean, is, the, the, the bond was really intense. Um, but how did the, the, the dynamic between the men in this platoon, how did it differ from what you may have observed in civilian men and just in your working life, or just in your personal life as well? Well, I, you know, I think I think men have a, a great capacity for functioning in groups. Um, I think they like functioning in groups. I think they like being part of a hierarchy, part of a group dynamic, uh, with a shared task, a group task. I, you know, I think that all that plays to a particular kind of male wiring. I, I, I just read recently in an academic paper um, that they took a group of men, had them do a task together, and then gave them an enemy, which I think probably was a rival team in the case of this experiment, gave them an, quote, enemy, and then they were, the, the, the group, the individuals in the group were, immediately collaborated uh, much more effectively, became much more tightly bonded as soon as they had an enemy. Uh, they took a group of women, did the same thing, and having an enemy group did not increase the um, level of cooperation between the women in the women's group. So there, there seems to be real differences between men and women in terms of how they uh, deal with each other in a group. Um, and the thing about civilian society is that there are no enemies. Like, so, so groups of men are not sort of forced into coalitions uh, by necessity. And that's, of course, a wonderful thing. I mean, no one needs another enemy. But on the other hand, because of our evolutionary past, we are wired for that. And some part of the male psyche, and maybe you could say the human psyche, uh, goes underutilized in a situation of great stability and safety. Right. And I, that kind of goes against the sort of the popular idea that men are sort of loners and you know, lone alpha wolves, men actually like to be working together in a group. I mean, I think sometimes women in pair bonds, women experience men as sort of loners because um, the men aren't, you know, off typically are not actually sharing their feelings. And um, I, I think women sort of decode that as a kind of insular individualism. Uh, when in fact, many men actually, many men like that, have this sort of other life, this sort of other side of their life where they're actively responding to groups of men um, in a way that might surprise the woman, actually. But they're not mis responding to groups of men where everyone's sharing their feelings. The, the, the group is uh, close and functional, 
uh, and tightly bonded precisely because people are, the men are not sharing their feelings. I mean, sort of quote oversharing of one's feelings when it was in her life actually can get in the way of healthy relations uh, in some cases and certainly for men. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, did the bond that you saw between the men in the platoon that you were working with in the Korangal Valley, was that what planted the seed for your latest book, Tribe? I actually, I've been thinking about Tribe since my early 20s in some ways. I had a, um, an uncle figure, a kind of mentor figure named Ellis, who was half Lakota to have Apache, and he was born, literally born on a wagon in 1929 during the Depression. And I remember when I was a kid, when I was young, him saying to me, you know, the, along the history of the frontier in this country, the white people were always running off to join the Indians, but the Indians never ran off to join the white people. And I thought about that my whole life, and um, that was even the case, uh, he told me that was even the case with white captives of the Indians who were adopted into Indian families in tribal societies, and when given the chance to come home by a peace treaty or what have you, um, that, that, that often these, these adopted, uh, adopted white members of Indian families didn't want to, did not want to go back to, quote, civilization. And, and as Alice pointed out, you, people go native, but they don't go civilized. We don't have any phrase for that. And um, so that stayed in my mind my whole life. And then I started to encounter soldiers who didn't want to go back to America. They wanted to stay you know, in combat and in affiliation with one another in Afghanistan. And it reminded me of what Ellis said. And, you know, my book, Tribe, is not about soldiers, and it's really not about PTSD. Right. In my third chapter, I use those topics as a way to illuminate the strengths and failings of modern society. When you have people who come from modern society, come from America, go overseas and experience life in a platoon in combat, they're basically experiencing a recreation of our evolutionary past. We evolved to live in groups of 30, 40, 50 people. I mean, that's the best guess in terms of our hominid ancestors of what life was like for hundreds of thousands of years. They experienced that very close ancient human affiliative group experience. And then they come back to our society what they see when they return is a great way of seeing our society with fresh eyes from a fresh perspective. And that's, that, that's how I use soldiers and PTSD as a way to sort of like do a, an X-ray as it were of modern society and what its shortcomings are. And, and for that matter, what it's, what its strengths are. So, I mean, there's a popular idea and I think this comes from, you know, uh, a very modern worldview and we're so in, deeply embedded in, in, in modern society. We have this idea that if there are disaster strikes, war strikes. Everyone's going to return to the sort of Hobbesian, every man for himself dystopia where people are going to be pillaging and, you know, the, the whole, you know, fantasy, apocalyptic fantasy is going to come life. But you argue that's not actually the case. I mean, what's the usual human response when disaster strikes? Well, I, I, if, if adversity and hardship and danger produced our worst human behaviors, we wouldn't exist as a species. I mean, we we evolved for two million years um, as a social species in a very harsh, dangerous environment. And if an attack by a lion or a rival tribe or a famine or an earthquake or what have you, if that produced antisocial behavior where every person fended for themselves, keep in mind we're a species where group survival is the only survival. And if it, if adversity produced individualization, we would have we would not have survived. We would not exist as a species. So. As an evolutionary principle, you can just assume that adversity brings out our higher human virtues rather than our lower human virtues. And um, so if you look at the historical record, that's absolutely the case. I mean, what happened in London during the Blitz? I mean, 30,000 people were killed during the bomb and German bombing campaign over the course of six months. Um, and if anything, uh, London society became more egalitarian, more tightly bonded, more collaborative, more cooperative. It did not descend into riots and mayhem and looting. Um, even New Orleans, where there was supposedly all this looting, I mean, there was a very small amount of that. It was people, hungry people looking for food. Um, and it was not a kind of um, widespread cashing in on the chaos. Uh, that, that, was, that was all really kind of urban myth. And actually, the, the uh, violent crime rate fell after Hurricane Katrina. Likewise, in New York City after 9-11, all this antisocial behavior declined 
the suicide rate went down, the violent crime rate went down in New York after 9-11. So humans respond extremely well to catastrophe. Uh, they don't turn on each other. They actually turn to each other for support and collaboration and, and, um, uh, and a kind of shared ethos of group survival. So, I mean, I'm curious, I mean, so there's this great power that comes with tribe, feeling you belong to a, this tight knit group, but it, you know, the thing I read, I, the feeling I got as I read your book, it seems like we can only get this power whenever we're facing some sort of very visceral challenge, right? We at war, natural disaster. So I'm curious, I mean, how do we capture the power of tribe when we live in a time of prosperity and peace and relative peace today? Um, well, we, we we basically have evolved into the situation, which is one of great great fortune. I mean, we're, you know, we're very very lucky human beings to live in an era of um, transporta- mass transportation and anesthesia, and if you have surgery, you get anesthesia and whatever. I mean, I, I mean, the list goes on and on of our of our blessings. But what you're kind of asking, uh, how do we have it all? How can we have the blessings right. of this modern society? And the societal bonding and societal strength of um, a, uh, of a of a society that's facing great adversity and 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 bonding together because of that. I, I don't know that we can. I mean, it it it, um, it may not be possible. Um, we're not going to dismantle the suburbs and start living in communal groups of thirty or forty people. That's not happening. Um, I think you could. Uh, I mean, just as a thought experiment, sure. you know, if you ban the car, if you ban the automobile, it would force people, like the Amish do, actually, it would force people to live within walking distance of their home. And um, the Amish, because they do not drive, they ride horses, which is also a limited transportation. Um, they have very low rates of, of suicide and and depression um, because they're because they're forced to live in communal groups. So, you know, one thing you could do is ban the car. Um, that's probably not going to happen either. So how do we keep exactly our same level of luxury and regain this sort of communal warmth and closeness? Um, I don't know. I, it, 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 um, I think it has to be a conscious, deliberate effort to look around you in the community that you live in, not the workplace, uh, not your rugby, you know, intramural rugby team or whatever. All these, all those, all those are great opportunities for human connection. But when you talk about community, you're talking about the people you can see from your front porch. You're talking about the people literally around you. And chances are you don't know half the people around you. I, I heard about a guy, an author actually, who lived in a neighborhood somewhere. I don't know where. And, um, someone was, um, murdered in the neighborhood. And he was so appalled at the lack of communal reaction to this tragedy that he spent a year sleeping in the homes of everyone in his neighborhood. I mean, with their permission, with their consent, obviously. He just made himself part of that family for a night. And he went around the entire community sleeping in everyone's homes trying to bond people together. Um, I think it's going to take a, a deliberate conscious act uh, to produce that those kinds of effects within communities that are obviously um, very dispersed and fragmented and not inward looking. And at the other end of the spectrum, at the sort of macro level, I think we have to have a um, a, a changed national consciousness of what it means to be part of a nation. Um, when you, I've done this, if you ask a room full of people, what do you owe your country? All you get is blank stares. No one has any idea what they owe this incredible entity that we all belong to, you know, other than their taxes. Uh, for most of human history, if you ask if you ask someone um, what they owed their um, their group, their people, their tribe, they would have an immediate answer, and they would probably say, "Well, if circumstances required, I owe them my life," and um, and that's something that's disappeared from the national conversation. And I think in order to feel like we belong to something, we have to renew that conversation and figure out what does it mean to be part of a country, part of a nation. What what, what are the duties? We all know the benefits. What are the duties? Well, so I'm curious. I mean, we talk about how it disappears. I mean, what happened? Was it this sort of just a byproduct of modernity? I mean, it just sort of these macro forces that, you know, economics, technology, that just sort of eroded that sense of community and belonging? Well, I think evolution has produced two opposing reactions in us. Um, one is 
the impulse towards uh, community because that 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 increases our survival our survival rate our survival chances. Um, the other impulse, which I think is also a product of our evolution, is to maximize of our maximize our individual benefit. Um, so when modern society evolved, when it developed in the last few hundred years, um, it produced enough enough capital, enough um, technology produced enough, took away the sort of physical burdens of actual survival to the point where we do not correctly, we do, we, we do not think we need to participate in the public good in order to ourselves physically survive. You don't literally need your neighbors, the people you can see from your bedroom window. You don't literally need them in order to put food on the table tonight. Uh, in order to defend yourselves from uh, the neighborhood across the river that might attack you, in order to defend yourselves from a predator that might wander into camp. You don't literally need those people. So there's no reason to contribute to the public good because there's no, you don't, you don't need the public good in order to survive. So what that means is that the, the other evolutionary imperative of maximizing individual benefit that's the only thing left standing, right? That actually works in a capitalist society. That works extremely well. Um, and, and that's the ethos that we all end up pursuing, but there's this gaping hole in our psyches, um, that left, left by the loss of community. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, some of those gaping holes, I mean, you, you know, make the case that a lot of the social illness or not social illness, mental illness, depression, uh, even some of like the mass shootings that we've been seeing that proliferating in the past, you know, 25 years might be a result of this lack of tribe in our life. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it, the cause and effect is hard to determine in a society that's this complex, but, um, but we do know that as wealth goes up in a society, modernity tends to go up. Um, and that brings with it an elevated suicide rate. So as wealth goes up in a society, the suicide rate goes up, not down. The depression rate goes up, not down. As income disparity increases, uh, anxiety disorders increase in the population. Um, one very interesting statistic from the Blitz in London was that the, the the government was prepared for mass psychiatric casualties during the Blitz, and uh, understandably, I mean, here's a civilian population that's getting you know bombed into the Stone Age by a by a modern air force, and um, to their surprise, the um, to the surprise of the authorities, the admissions to psych wards went down during the Blitz in London. You know, one official said, um, "We have." He said, we have neurotics driving ambulances. You know, basically, when your community is being attacked or is under some kind of stress, um, everyone everyone realizes that they're actually needed, that their people need them, like their community needs them, and that buffers people against their own psychological demons. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So, I mean, Sebastian, I mean, this is there's a lot more we could dig into, um, and the book was fantastic, but where can people learn more about about it and the rest of your work? Well, my website is sebastianyounger.com, and it has, obviously, all my books, all my films uh, on there. Tribe is prominently displayed. Um, I, have a, I have an idea for helping veterans return to society uh, called uh, a Veterans Town Hall. And basically, you give on Veterans Day in every country, in every uh, town or city in this country, you open the town hall to... Um, to veterans to speak for 10 minutes each veterans of any war. And we've done this. We even had a world war two veterans stand up uh, veterans of any war have the chance to stand up and speak for 10 minutes to the community about war, what war felt like. It's not patriotism. It's not anti-war activism. It's just, this is what it felt like to go to war for everybody, for you all in the room. And it's an incredibly cathartic thing for the veterans, but it also gives the community a chance to feel like a community in the ancient tribal sense. And I, think that if this idea spread enough, um, it might actually produce that at a sort of nationwide level. So on my website, sebastianyounger.com, there is a page for Veterans Town Hall. And it's very, the principles are simple. The guidelines are simple. You don't need a license. You don't need permission. You don't need anything. And you certainly don't need money to do this. You just have to um, convince the town manager to unlock the doors on Veterans Day. And you can do this yourselves. And it's a very, very powerful experience. I love that. Well, Sebastian Younger, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. 
Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. My guest today was Sebastian Younger. His latest book is called Tribe. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Go check it out. And also make sure to check out his other work, uh, War. It's available on Amazon as well. And you can also watch his documentary, Restrepo. Uh, You can get that on Amazon.com too. 